everyone. Thank you for your patience as we get this, this keynote prepared. It is well worth the wait. Um, on behalf of the planning committee, I am thrilled to introduce our keynote. Uh, Jack P. Shankoff, MD, is the Julius B. Richmond Family Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. But hold on, because there's a whole lot of other qualifications coming, and they're well worth it. Okay, you can cut that short if you'd like. That's really Are you fun. sure? Because Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, he chairs yes. many, many, many centers at, at Harvard and um, Massachusetts General Hospital, doing amazing work, um, bringing credible science to bear on public policy affecting children and families, one of the things we're talking about today, and the JPB Research Network on Toxic Stress, which is developing new measures of stress effects and resilience in young children. Um, and this is important. Under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Shankoff has served as chair of the Board of on Children, Youth, and Families and led a blue ribbon committee that produced the landmark report, report from Neurons to Neighborhoods, the Science of Early Childhood Development. He has received multiple honors. Um, I'm not gonna list all of them, just know they just go on and on and on as they should. Um, he has authored more than 150 publications and has been visiting professor or delivered name lectureships at more than 35 universities in the United States and around the world. Um, every time I have the pleasure of hearing you speak, uh, Dr. Shankov, my understanding of early childhood development and and the systems that surround the developing child and just humanity in general are both deepened and expanded. And I just prepare everyone for an amazing keynote. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Well, that that's um, introduction. So um, let me just say I'm really happy to be part of this conference and really sorry that I'm not there in person, but let me let me just get started because I know we want to have some good interactive conversations. So the title of my talk is Leveraging the Science of Adversity and Resilience, talking about both, to basically see how we can generate greater impacts on whole child development across the board, across the entire early childhood ecosystem. So if I could have the next uh, click, please. Is that not working? Ah, there we go. So um, we are living through a, truly a revolution in 21st century biology. The science space actually was a nice reference to from neurons to neighborhoods. That was 20 years ago. And at that point, we were just at the beginning of this revolution in, in um, neuroscience and molecular biology. The Human Genome Project had not even happened yet. So we are living through this incredible revolution in biology that is showing the power of really a new mindset for early childhood policy practice. And that, I'm going to begin and end with that message in my opening remarks. It is really time uh, for us to build on all of the rich knowledge that we've accumulated over half a century in, in early childhood policy and practice and, and think about a new mindset that mines this kind of dr these dramatic advances in 21st century science. So there are kind of three concepts that I'm going to put up for you um, to begin and set the table for this presentation. So the first, if we can have the next click, please. Um, first is we need to connect the brain to the rest of the body. I'm, I, my assumption is that pretty much everybody in the audience is aware of the basic principles of how we understand the way early experience affects the development of the brain and how kind of positive, supportive, responsive environments build kind of strong brain architecture for all of the skills that children need early in life to be prepared for school. Um, and that excessive activation of the stress response um, related to a variety of sources of adversity can disrupt brain circuits and lead to problems in learning, social and emotional development, and readiness for school. So the first major message here in terms of this new mindset is um, something we've all known, but now we need to start paying attention. The brain is connected to the rest of the body. So that everything that we've said about the brain and have learned about the brain applies to the immune system, it applies to metabolic regulatory systems, it applies to all of these developing systems in the body. All of them, the brain, immune system, metabolic systems are reading the environment very early on, actually beginning prenatally, and adjusting their development based on how to best adapt to the environment in which we're living. And 
Um, I'm going to actually, I've never used this before in a presentation since I'm in Texas, virtually. Um, I think you guys know something about sports. I think you have some interest in baseball and basketball and maybe even football. Um, I'm going to use football as my example here of um, basically think of the brain and all of these other biological systems as a well-oiled team. And you all know that a winning team requires, um, has a captain, it has people playing different positions, and it requires on everyone at each position to be doing what he is supposed to do, he or she, I should say, is supposed to do. Um, and when they operate well as a team together, you have a winning combination. So the brain, the immune system, metabolic systems, the cardiometabolic system, they are all reading the environment. And in a reasonably predictable environment with, with reasonable levels of manageable stress, the absence of stress is not good for children. We, stress is a part of our lives. You have to learn how to deal with it. So all these systems are responding to the environment, communicating with each other through feedback loops, and this is how all of them develop together. So I'm not going to spend more time talking about the brain because I'm assuming you all have heard a lot about that, but let's talk about the immune system, right? So the immune system is reading the environment. Immediately after birth, the immune system is exposed to microorganisms it's never been exposed to before. It's been in a sterile environment. Um, and so it is responding, and the first response is inflammation, which is the way the immune system protects us. Um, and that's really great. Without an immune system, we're in a life-threatening situation. So it's meant to activate the immune system, respond to a stress or a threat or a, a germ, and then it goes back to baseline. But if the immune system is continuously stimulated in a negative way, like the brain could be by adversity, chronic inflammation goes from being helpful in an acute situation to actually being associated with greater risk for many, many chronic diseases. So Chronic inflammation accelerates atherosclerosis, increases your risk for heart disease. Chronic inflammation also affects insulin resistance, which makes you more likely to develop cardio, um, you know, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and, di and diabetes. Um, the metabolic system, which is providing energy stores for the body. So blood sugar goes up in the face of adversity. That's good, that's really good, but if blood sugar stays up for prolonged periods of time, it also can lead to insulin resistance, leading to problems with obesity and metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And during the prenatal period, even before we're born, um, the brain and all these other systems are responding to the prenatal environment, which is why nutrition is so important during pregnancy. And we've had, there have been multiple studies in countries around the world of the impact of famine during pregnancy in otherwise healthy populations. And have found that when women are pregnant during periods of famine, and food shortage. And their babies generally on average have much lower birth weights. But then when the famine is gone and people are eating regularly and the babies are being fed regularly, there's a higher rate of obesity and heart disease and diabetes in babies who in utero were exposed to kind of inadequate nutrition. The reason is these systems were reading not enough nutrition. So they were regulating the ability to conserve calories. They, Set the, this is part of the reason why these patterns are set early and we spend the rest of our adult lives trying to exercise and eat better and lose weight and we have trouble because some of these systems are set early on in life. So everything we've always, hold on that next one for a second. So everything that we've said about the brain, about early experiences affecting its development, apply to all these other systems. Now, setting up this mindset that says we should not just be thinking about impacts on learning, but we should be thinking about early influences on long-term physical and mental health. So now we have the second concept here, which is variation and sensitivity to the environment. Everything that we are interested in, in the development of young children, everything that pediatric primary care pays attention to and everything that healthcare focuses on for the entire life course is a product of the interaction between the environment and genetic variation. And we are learning more and more about that. We know that from things like there are cancers that run in families. So we know there's a genetic component, but not everybody in the family gets that cancer. There are people who live in areas where there's a higher rate of a certain kind of cancer. And we say, there must be something in the environment. Maybe it's in the water, maybe it's in the air. We need to find it. Or not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. Not everybody who lives 
in an environment with a high cancer rate gets that cancer. So everything is about gene environment interaction. Implications for early childhood, we, can, we traditionally have been screening for risk factors like low parent education, low family income. Um, now there's a lot of interest in screening for ACEs. It's very important to know that those give us useful information at a population level, but they don't tell us what we need to know in the pediatric office about the child who's sitting on that table. Because even if you're in a high risk group, there will be variability about whether you will or will not be having problems. And if you're in a low risk group, it doesn't mean that you won't have problems. So we really need to understand this notion of built into our biology is the fact that we are differentially sensitive to the environment. That's, there's some understandings of that at the molecular level, and your grandmother could have told you that, and everybody who has more than one child can tell you that, or anybody who knows somebody who has more than one child can tell you that even though you're living in the same family, everybody is not equally sensitive to the environment. And we, now we have a lot of basic science to understand that. Kind of the next click, the third principle. The third concept is the importance of timing in critical periods. This is the issue about decreasing plasticity over time. So again, I think most people in the audience, of course, all the medical people in the audience are very familiar with the importance of critical periods. Strabismus is the, is the, the first example we think of, the lazy eye. We know there's a period early in life and the development of the visual cortex and the brain that you need to have good input from two eyes that are aligned. We've got about eight years to do something about that uh, during that critical period of development of the visual cortices. Um, after eight years, um, if you develop amblyopia, um, you have a perfectly normal eye, but it's, you can't see with that eye because there was a critical period in the development of those circuits. We also know there are critical periods in the development of uh, uh, various parts of the brain involved in language development. But now we're also learning more and more that there are critical and sensitive periods in the development of the immune system, in the development of metabolic systems that also early on make it uh, at a time when they are optimally responsive to environmental influences and that then set their patterns and set their regulatory mechanisms. And they are increasingly more difficult to then change later. I wanna make a really important point about this because in most cases, even in the case of amblyopia now, People have questions about that. We can talk about it later. Um, this is not the window closing completely. It's not saying that we've, it's all over, it's too late. It's just saying it is harder to fix things later and change them later than it would have been to get it right the first time. And what's most important is that the science is telling us that the prenatal period and the first two to three years after birth are particularly important for many of these biological systems much earlier than most of our early intervention programs are attending to when they focus largely on preschool. So in the first one to two years of life, the immune system, the metabolic systems, were already setting some patterns that will be harder to change. So this is all about interactions among all the biological systems, gene environment interaction and timing. These are the big headlines of a deeper understanding in terms of where science is now to help us kind of open up the hood, look under the hood, and start to understand much better about how, what is it about early experiences, and particularly severe adversity early in life, that leads to predictable disparities on a population level, in not just educational achievement, but physical and mental health. So let me go to the next slide now. I'm gonna have a click. Um, and I wanna say a little bit about um, resilience before I go on to get into some more concrete examples, because, um, uh, I think those of us who have been very interested in this concept of toxic stress, which is different from regular stress and it's different from tolerable stress, it's a much greater extreme, um, have really learned now that we should never talk about toxic stress without talking about resilience at the same time, because we're not talking about over-deterministic early damage. We're talking about in disruptions that increase the risk for things later. And it's very important to understand that resilience is neither something that is totally inborn, and there's nothing you can do about it, that's not true. Also, resilience is not something that you can will yourself to have all by yourself. Resilience is built over time, 
and I'm going to just very quickly talk about what we know from a science perspective, but how we build resilience, keeping in mind the principles that I just spoke about. So um, the punchline here, the take home message is that supportive relationships and skill building can increase resilience over time. But let me walk you through this slide to kind of um, demystify a little bit of a lot of complicated science. So to be very simple about it, each of us is living with things that are good in our lives and things that are not so good in our lives. None of us are in a risk-free situation. None of us are completely protected from everything. And generally speaking, if you think of this teeter-totter here, um, if the number of positive factors, we might call them protective factors in your life, on one side of the scale, and the risk factors, the things that undermine healthy development on the other side, generally speaking, if you've got more protective factors, it tilts the scale in the favor of positive outcomes. So people who live healthy lives and do well in school and everything else, not people without risk factors in their lives. It's just that you've got more protective factors. Okay? So generally speaking, it's true. If I can have the next click, what are some of the most important protective factors that, um, that we know from science across a variety of fields? Can I have the next click, please? <clears throat> so, um, Responsive relationships, supportive community services, an increasing sense of mastery over your own life, and faith and cultural traditions, all of which have been shown to be associated with better outcomes in the face of adversity. So we know the kinds of things that we can look for and build on to improve life outcomes, even in the face of adversity. But if you could look at this, it's a schematic, it's kind of as a metaphor, that when you're looking at a, a scale or a teeter-totter or a seesaw, there's a fulcrum in the middle here. Very important. Think of the fulcrum as something that represents your kind of genetic predisposition, that whether you're kind of genetically more adaptable or less adaptable. So if I can have the next click, there are some children from birth. Next click, please. This fulcrum is not in the middle. It's kind of a little bit displaced. These are the, these are the kids who are genetically um, a little bit more sensitive to the environment and therefore more vulnerable, more susceptible to adversity. So you see here, if your fulcrum is moved, you might have more positive protective factors in your life, but you're still going to be moving in the direction of negative outcomes because you are more susceptible to the risk factors in life. But the important thing, this is true about everything that's genetic, is it's not fixed. It's not deterministic. It says what your risks are, what your likelihood is. So what could we do with if we have the next click, if we provide supportive, responsive relationships and scaffold the development of these building blocks of resilience, uh, adaptability, um, executive function and self-regulation skills, by doing those things, we can actually move the fulcrum. Your genes don't change, your, gen your genotype doesn't change, but what, how your genes work and what turns them on and what turns them off in response to adversity changes and that's how we build resilience. So we need to be very serious about adversity and it's potentially disruptive effects in every organ system. We need to understand that this is not a fixed outcome and that there are things that we can do to strengthen the building blocks of resilience. Okay, next slide. So one thing that's been kind of known for a long, long time and there's much more attention being paid to this now in our society as a result of a lot of public attention and issues related to racism and social inequities, is that there's an urgent need to confront the upstream adversities, not what's in the child-parent relationship and not just what we can attend to in a pediatric office visit or at an early childhood program, center-based or home-based, but that the upstream adversities that impose disproportionate stresses on families of color and other marginalized groups that are part of the increasing adversity that many families have to deal with in a burden by. So if I could have the next couple of clicks, one, two, three, stop right there, um, that if we look at differences by race and by ethnicity, looking at the black population, Latinx compared to whites, and this is just a few examples, is that families of color experiencing more, experience more multiple adversities face more problems with violence in the neighborhoods in which they live, have more financial hardships, all of which we're being asked to pay more attention to in primary 
pediatric practice and in early childhood programs. But clearly, the ultimate answer is not just how do we help parents buffer their kids from adversities, but how do we start thinking upstream? This is this is bread and butter pediatrics, right? We are we have in our in our built into our brains prevention, right? And prevention means going upstream to early causes and not just trying to treat the symptoms down the road. So we need to be paying a lot more attention to these disproportionate stresses experienced on a population level. I'll say something about this at the end. Um, if I could go to the next slide, please. So I want to say a little bit about um, about looking at, so it's, it's hard not to, it's hard to get away from the impact of the pandemic right now, not only in our daily lives, but in, in providing an opportunity for us to kind of rethink some of the ways in which we deal with challenges to healthy development. There's certainly been a lot of attention paid to the inequalities and the impact of the pandemic in terms of who's most likely to get infected, who's most likely to have serious disease, and which part of the population is higher death rates, and we know that there are big racial differences here and ethnic disparities as well. So I wanna just say a few words about taking an early childhood lens. What could we learn from the pandemic that could help us think about where the early childhood field needs to go as we rebuild it? I think most people in the field understand that although a huge part of the early childhood field has been massively disrupted and parts of it are gonna have a hard time coming back. It's not like there was a strong infrastructure in the beginning. But I think everyone understands that the goal is not just when we get out at the other end of the tunnel to go back to where we were, but to see how we can build an even stronger childhood system going forward. So here are some lessons that we ought to be thinking about. I'm not giving you answers to these, but this should be part of our reflection on what can we learn about what we want to build going forward. So we can have the next click, please. Um, so racism and other structural inequities um, have gotten a lot of attention in the pandemic context. And we know from population studies for a hundred years or more that there are racial and ethnic disparities in health outcomes in this country and in every other country in the world. And it's not just related to access to the healthcare system. And so most people now have gotten used to this term pre-existing conditions, um, not just in terms of health insurance, but in terms of susceptibility to uh, mortality from COVID-19. And if you start to think about what the most um, important pre-existing conditions are to put you at risk for, for COVID-19, it's obesity, it's heart disease, it's diabetes, it's hypertension. We have the list of diseases that are more common among people of color and families who face serious poverty. And now the science is telling us, guess what? Those diseases start early. The origins begin prenatally. They've been in early childhood. It's not just, it's not just, it's, it's very important, but not just about kind of, you know, whether you have a job that you can work in at home. It's really, it's about how these pre-existing diseases start early. This is a challenge for us in the early childhood period. We need to start to address it. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to get into the politics of this, but I, I think most of us, can appreciate that if we're going to promote health and prevent disease, we desperately need the best cutting edge science we can get, and we need measures that we can trust, right? Without measures, we're kind of flying without radar, and without credible science, we're not going to be able to develop vaccines and therapeutics that will give us better impacts. So this is another message to the early childhood field. We have done a lot for half a century based on very solid developmental and behavioral science um, but we have a biological science that is exploding over the last 20 years, and we have not brought that in to our thinking as much as we need to do. And we haven't brought in what, need, what is on the horizon in terms of biological measurement that will help us be better and smarter and more effective, starting in the primary care setting. You could have the next slide, please. I think next click. Um, so without, um, just so you see that I'm not like a blinded, science chauvinist and saying that science has all the answers. I, for me, science has to be at the table. If it's not at the table, we're in big trouble. But if we're going to make good policy and we're going to implement good services, we have to understand the need for comparable respect for science, for personal beliefs, and for lived experiences. 
if we don't, if we haven't learned anything from this pandemic, it's that we need all three to be on the same page in order to optimally use the knowledge we have to face some of the challenges that are in front of us. If I could have the next clip. Um, the final piece here, which is just a reaffirmation of something that everybody in the early childhood field knows, is if we want to do something about the health and well-being of young children, we have to understand that it's inextricably tied to the health and well-being of the adults who care for them. We can't bypass parents, and we actually have to pay a lot of attention to the people who work in early childhood programs, about whether their well-being and their needs are met, because that's the key to helping children. We can't, there's no magic dust. Uh, that we can put on kids to kind of help them be better without the adults who care for them. Okay, the next clip, I'm going to move through a little bit more quickly now because we've got a lot of good discussion time to do, although we did start late, so I don't think I'm too far behind. Um, so what I want to do now, um, uh, that the science that I presented to you, I, I really just presented the headlines. There's a lot of very deep, very complex science behind it. Um, at the end, I give you some guidance on to get on our website if you want to really get into the science. But what I'd like to do now is talk about how do we take this complicated science and distill it into kind of really powerful, simple principles that can help provide a framework for improving our impact on child health and development across sectors, not just primary health care, but ch um, child care and early care and education and home visiting programs, human service programs. So if we take all of these scientific concepts and boil them down into three core principles. Here are three principles that could be used in any setting and in a policymaking arena to say, what does science tell us about how to improve outcomes for kids? Okay, point number one, if I can have the clip. And most of you should start yawning at this point because I'm not telling you anything that you do not know. Building responsive relationships between children and the adults who care for them is critical. It helps to buffer children against excessive stress activation, and it helps to build their own foundational skills for adaptive coping and resilience. The next click, please, is reducing sources of stress. Um, rather than just focus on how do we help people cope with stress, how about reducing the sources of stress? Great preventive pediatric thinking. And those, so there's much more attention to that now, and the American Academy of Pediatrics is paying a lot of attention. Things like, how many years ago did we not talk in primary care about paying attention to housing instability and food insecurity? And we need to start adding to that the impacts and the hardships and the threats of living on a day-to-day -day basis with the effects of systemic racism and interpersonal discrimination and a lot of the other things. And the way that we are unpacking poverty and getting more specific, we need to unpack what it means to be contending with the uh, the very visible and some of the not so visible signs of racism in a daily life. And if I can have the third um, click, uh, building core skills. I'm not going to say anything more about it except to say that's what I referred to earlier in terms of the, the building blocks and the skills needed to uh, manage the stresses of life don't come in automatically on automatic pilot. They are scaffolded and coached and modeled and practiced in the child, parent, and child adult relationship. So at this point, I think all of you would say, well, this is really nice and interesting, but um, you're not telling me something I don't know. So let me have the next click. <laughs> I know that you all know this, but the devil is in the details, right? So yeah, we need to do this, but we're not, we don't always know how to successfully strengthen relationships or how to reduce sources of stress or how to build these skills and also taking into account the variability. So I wanna go back to that second concept on the first slide. Not only do we need to understand how children and their parents are, have, are variable, vary in the way they respond to the environment. That also includes variability. What else is part of the environment? How about the policies and programs that we deliver? Those are part of the environment. So we need to understand that there's no, the field has always talked about there's no one size fits all. Everybody knows that. But even when we talk about what we might call evidence-based programs, evidence-based programs mean a study showed on average a statistically significant effect. Actually, that masks the reality, which is those programs are having much bigger effects than the average effect for some kids and very small effects or no effects for others because we know now at a molecular level that there's variability and sensitivity 
everything that goes on, including the environment and including the dimensions. So we need to dig deeper into these core concepts and understand how they will help us match what we do to what's the individual assets and needs of the families and children we work with. So I go to the next slide and following the guidance of the people, the, the people who very wisely organized this meeting, who asked me to be, give some practical examples and that can really be put into practice. So let me take these three principles and show you how we can really develop, and these are just a few examples, the very simple things that could be done in a primary care context and it could be done in a variety of other programs. So, so how, do we, how do we strengthen responsive relationships? By coaching parents and caregivers on the importance of what we call serve and return interactions, beginning in the earliest of infancy, in engaging in an interactive way, and watching, looking for signals from a, a baby, a young child, and doing something back in response and watching the way they respond to us. That kind of back and forth is essential for healthy brain development and well-regulated biological systems. Provide fun activities for parents and children to do together, not just toys that kids can play with by themselves, but that kind of interactive um, activity that helps strengthen relationships. In terms of building core skills, we could suggest the kinds of games that help children build executive function, self-regulation skills. Why is Simon Says so much fun for kids? What is that all about? It's remembering the rules and it's, it's changing your behavior when the rules shift. That's, a, that's an executive function, self-regulation kind of game that builds those skills. If you don't have those opportunities, it's harder to build those skills. And also establishing regular household routines with children, um, sleeping times, feeding times, the routines around those. This creates a more predictable, well-regulated environment, which is tough if you're holding down two jobs and juggling childcare. It's tough if you're under a lot of stress, but those kinds of routines help to regularize biological functions that promote healthy development. And finally, in terms of reducing sources of stress is to identify, help families identify where the most important stresses are in their lives and together figuring out solutions. And why do I have a picture of a baby with a diaper here? Because many studies have shown that if you ask poor people with limited income or, or money to buy things, what are some of the greatest stresses? The cost of diapers is what kind of drives a lot of people to despair. And there are diaper banks around the country that provide free diapers. It may sound kind of funny, but boy, does that relieve a source of stress. So a lot of creative ways to think about that the best advice and examples will come from parents themselves. So if I could go to the next slide. Um, so I'm finishing up now and I'm gonna give you your take home messages. This is, there are so many quotes attributed to Albert Einstein. I think he didn't actually say many of them. Um, but I think this is what he probably said. He said, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. This, this was his insight into the kind of revolutionary thinking that allowed him to create the theory of relativity and others that basically just thought about things in a way that nobody thought about before. We have a way of thinking about early childhood that had its roots more than a half a century ago in the great society programs and the war on poverty programs, which by the way, were driven by some Senator from Texas who became vice president and then president of the United States, right? So, and a lot of the, that way of thinking um, had a lot of tremendous uh, uh, gravitas and reality to it that still holds today. But I'm gonna end with four take home messages about how the science is telling us about how we have to modify and expand our thinking. So if I could have the next click. Einstein, so here are the key elements of a mindset shift. If I present, I, I, I gotta be careful about it. I don't have all the answers. I'm not saying that I'm like the smartest guy in the room. I'm, I'm saying this is what science is telling us that we should be thinking about. These are not answers. These are new pathways toward things that we have to start paying more attention to that are grounded in where science is right now if we want to use it. It's science is sitting there waiting for us to use it. If we don't use it, it keeps expanding. If we think about how to use it, we could have some we could think about how we might make much greater impacts at scale in what we're doing, in both policy and in how we invest what are always limited resources. 
So you know, here are my four take-home messages for you about a new mindset. I can have the first clip. Early experiences affect, and this is my summary of what I've said, so nothing new here. Early experiences affect lifelong health, not just school readiness and later educational achievement. And each of the things I'm going to follow is a not just, it's not diminishing the importance of school readiness and early and later achievement in school. It's basically saying health is just as important and it's sitting there waiting for us to focus on. It. Next click, please. The need to focus on protecting developing brains from excessive adversity and other biological systems. That we need to focus more on protecting these developing systems on the developing brain, not just provide enrichment for developing minds. And one of the things that the science ought to help us think about is maybe the children who are benefiting the least from really well-designed and well-executed early care and education programs are doing it not because they're not motivated and not because the people who are providing it are not providing a rich experience, but maybe there's been so much disruption to their ability to focus their attention and control their impulses and engage in gold actor behavior that more enrichment is not the answer. We have to protect these developing systems from the disruptions of serious adversity. Third click, please. The need to confront inequalities, inequalities and opportunity. I'm talking about inequalities and opportunity. I'm talking about leveling the playing field. This is something that everybody in this country should be able to easily resonate to. It's giving everybody a fair chance at the start. I'm not going to get into uh, what, how, how people feel about the way things should be uh, rated in adult life and who's responsible for what, but if we want a level playing field, of opportunity, which is what this country is all about, we have to confront the inequalities and opportunity related to the burdens of racism and discrimination, and not just the hardships of poverty. It's not saying that poverty doesn't remain a very important focus, but 50 plus years ago, more than that now, when all of these programs began, Head Start, home visiting programs, Job Corps, community health centers, the focus was poverty. The focus was not racism. And we haven't really kind of thought about how we need to address that as much as we need to address poverty. And the time has come to kind of dig under the hood on that as well and recognize that it's not just about saying, hang in there. The next click, please. And this will be the last one. So, this is now I'm speaking to my pediatric colleagues. I am a pediatrician. I'm a pediatrician by training. I have not been in the clinical setting for quite a while. Um, but here's the, here's the opportunity that is sitting in front of the pediatric community now, particularly the primary care pediatric community. There is an opportunity right now as we think about how to rebuild the early childhood ecosystem. There is no part of the, of the old early childhood system or the one that we have right now it has as stable an infrastructure as primary care pediatrics. Okay? And we have to be thinking about whether we think of it in terms of that's the place where just about everybody is seen shortly from shortly after birth. That's where parents are more likely to hang in there while they get their immunizations. <laughs> there is a screening and surveillance function. There is an early identification function. There is a, a family support and family counseling function. And there is what is true for every part of pediatrics. When we identify needs for additional services, we don't refer and walk away, we remain engaged. We also answer the question always of, is what we're doing working? Should we be doing something different? So we need to think about pediatrics as sitting there a prime and critical infrastructure for early childhood policy going forward as part of an integrated ecosystem and get away from this kind of old issue of how do we link pediatrics to the early childhood system? We shouldn't be thinking about linking pediatrics to your childhood system. It should be at the heart. And by the way, for those of you in that system, um, there's also the issue of, of reimbursement, right? And everybody now is looking for how can we get Medicaid to pay for more of these things? Well, we can do that if in fact, we make it clear that this is as much about health as it is about learning. And so there's more infrastructure and there's more sustainable funding for early childhood in the healthcare system, but it has to be an integrated part of a new system and not just how do we connect to pediatrics. So 
I can have the last click. Um, so this is our website. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with it. For those of you who are not, we've got a ton of material on there uh, dealing with a lot of really getting deeply into the science and materials that are intended to make the science understandable to non-scientists without dumbing it down, but just making it comprehensible. Um, and so I invite you, um, our most recent working paper that came out last June, um, interestingly enough, was entitled Connecting the Brain to the Rest of the Body. So if you want to get deeper into that, there it is. So I'll, I'll stop right here. I'm sorry if I ran a little bit over, but um, I am really, ex I have to say, I'm really excited now to have a chance to have a conversation about this rather than just talk at a screen. So um, thanks again for the invitation to be part of this, and let's talk. Let's have a conversation. Wow. Jack, that was well, amazing. Me, now I've got to turn up the volume so I can hear you. That was amazing. Thank you. There's so much that you... So I'm really, I'm back in an echo chamber. I'm going to try to find a good balance here. Thank goodness. Well, as you're doing that, I'll just share. First of all, thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, Jack made sort of a funny comment as we were starting that some of our technical difficulties, for those of us who are kind of high achievers, those little things really stress us out. And paying attention to that level of stress, if you want to know what the families that we're trying to work with feel on a pretty regular basis, like that stress that is unusual for us is pretty constant. So your observation there really stuck with me. But that presentation was great. I love that you ended it on the role of pediatrics and this potentially really critical kind of nexus that they play in early childhood. And we've got a lot of pediatricians who are listening today as well as other folks in the medical sector. So I kind of want to push you even a little bit more than those fabulous core takeaways and ask you, in the realm of the possible, not assuming any major reimbursement shifts, but you know, it's one thing for pediatricians to know science. And thanks to you and others, I really think the science is getting out there and people understand there's toxic stress. But it's a whole other thing to know what to do with the science. So what would be your advice for our pediatric colleagues who are listening in about one sort of, or a couple, things that they can do within their existing practice that would better integrate the science into their everyday work? You know, I, it's, a, it's a really important question. And let me, let me start by, you know, I'm going to have to keep adjusting the volume. So when I'm talking, I'm turning it down. Um, I, want to, I want to start with a message of solidarity with my colleagues in pediatrics. Um, we have been inadequately trained to do the work that we're being asked to do. Um, and, because that's a simple thing to say, and uh, it's not a it's not a simple thing to fix. Um, but we need to own up to the fact that uh, our training, starting in medical school and, and through residency, um, was much more focused on on caring for sick kids than promoting health and thinking about whole child development. So there's a lot of catch up to do. Um, what pediatricians I think have in the bank is parents' trust and the opportunity to develop a relationship that starts very early and continues for a long time. Um, and I think what, what, what needs to happen, and we work hard on that, and the stuff we put up on our website, is to provide material for pediatricians and others to kind of answer your question about what can I do, concrete examples and advice. We have a number of, of pieces. This is not a promotional there's not a promotional thing for my center. A lot of other people have that, but there's material out there. But I think what I think the most important role for pediatricians, other than us hoping that our training catches up with this someday, is the fact that there's so much hardcore science behind this, which is driving the leading edge of tertiary care medicine. It's the same science. It's understanding what's going on inside the body. Is that, is that if pediatricians in learning the science could be playing a role in shaping how we think about what should we do, problem solving, right? We don't have simple answers for many problems and we need to start thinking that it should be based on matching scientific principles with the lived experiences of parents, right? So if we're gonna talk about reducing stress and why that's important and how to build resilience, 
what pediatrics can bring to the table with authority, as people will listen to this, the messenger matters, is that this is not, this is not just like being a warm-hearted soul. There's hard science behind this. And if we're serious about even, even, even from a hard-nosed return on investment point of view, what's the most, other than the national debt and a lot of entitlements for, um, for the older population, um, and including that, one of the biggest parts of our budget is healthcare, and it's exploding. And healthcare is getting more and more expensive. And the answer is not going to be controlling the cost of new drugs and expensive technology as much. It's going to be, let's have fewer people with heart disease, fewer people with diabetes. And if you start to do, you know, we've, we've made a lot out of the return on investment from an educational point of view in terms of people being more economically productive and the lower cost of incarceration, which is a big problem. But if we do the, the thought, if we decreased health, if we decreased heart disease, by 1% as opposed to what we do you know, in early childhood. That's billions of dollars already right there. So I think pediatrics needs to not only be involved on the ground in working with all of these other disciplines in an integrated sector. We can't do it by ourselves, but we shouldn't be turfing it, just referring it and saying good luck. But the other thing that nobody else can provide with the knowledge and the gravitas that pediatrics can be is to start driving the science-based argument for how this is really getting at the roots of not just human capital development, but the health of the population. And we need to keep pushing that. I mean, the regular of pediatrics is kind of moving in that direction and everybody on the ground in, in your communities needs to be a messenger for that. And then to say, we need to figure this out. This is good old American ingenuity needs to now figure out how to do this. We don't have all the answers, but we know this isn't just in my day when I was a resident, all the things we're talking about were a referral to social service. I mean, social service is very important right now, but referring to social service is not the pediatric role right now. It's really digging in and being part of the team. I need to make my answer shorter so you can get more questions. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Songhoff, thank you again for all the time you you're can spending call me Jack. with us It'll today. Make me more Thank you, Jack. Sorry, my Southern upbringing <laughs> kicked in there for a minute. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about measurement. So as we and the public sector look Hang to on invest second, in this wait, kind I've of work. A, I have having a hard time. I got to get through the echo. Oh, uh, sorry. Try that again. I'm really sorry. It's just. Oh, no, no problem. Is it okay now? It's tolerable stress. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Good deal. If you actually talk um, a little so slower, I'll, I'll I'll because then I can send you keep thought. ahead of the echo. That, it just... Okay. I'll send you a real softball question, and that is around measurement. So as we look to invest in approaches that work and to prove value in healthcare systems and other places, what piece of the science around measurement and measuring impact has you most excited yeah, right now? That's a, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And um, you had mentioned in, the, in my introduction about the JPB uh, Research Network on Toxic Stress. So there's a group of scientists and clinicians and community leaders, uh, actually primarily in communities of color, who we've been working with for five years on developing a battery of measures of stress activation excessive stress activation. Um, so before I tell you a little bit more about the science, let me say that the possibility of being able to do something other than just ask parents how they feel the kids are doing. You know, we wouldn't, parent reports and parent rating scales are tremendously important. They tell us what parents think. They tell us what they're concerned about. They tell us what they want us to talk with them about. But we wouldn't settle for a parent checklist for lead screening we wouldn't say, so do you think there's lead in your child's environment? Do you think your child may have a lead? We have a way of measuring that. Um, and then I'd also, we get linked to treatments, and then we have a way of measuring whether the treatment worked. Same thing, we wouldn't ask a parent, do you think your child's a little bit anemic? Uh, you know, we, we screen, we do a hematocrit at a certain point, and we know, we find anemia when it exists, and we treat it, and we have a test to measure that the treatment worked, because sometimes the treatment doesn't work. Remember, differences. And, um, we, if someone comes in with a fever, we don't just pick an antibiotic off the shelf, right? Um, and so, and we have a way of measuring it. Sometimes kids are resistant. The bug is resistant or someone's allergic. 
So the same thing now, we know that excessive stress activation is can be damaging over time. And we need ways to measure that, right? So, um, and some of that has been done in various types. People have used cortisols for different reasons, but it hasn't, the knowledge base is not really well defined yet. But now there are measures of inflammation, pro-inflammatory cytokines, if you certain of them, if you know at that level, um, oxidative stress uh, affects, affects methylation of parts of the genome. There are a number of things that are really in the research realm right now that are ways that we have been studying biological effects of excessive stress activation. If there was a way to kind of create a simple, feasible to incorporate in primary care, affordable screen for excessive stress activation, um, as a way also to measure who's responding to interventions that are designed to bring those down, that would be an incredible tool. Having said that, I mean, we're working on that and there's a, we have a battery that we're piloting now and that we're kind of trying to norm. And, and it, it's very complex scientific work, but actually it's the easy part. The hard part is how to make that something that is empowering for families and that isn't misused. Uh, biological measurement, this is, you know, the, it's very hard in the history of biology to find where biology has ever been good to people of color. Uh, biology has been used to advance racist ideologies. Um, research, biological research in communities of color, and particularly blacks, have, is filled with exploitation. So this is dangerous for misuse, which is why from the beginning we've had a group of community leaders, primarily people of color, who both are very wary of the misuse, but also eager to have better tools to be able to help promote the health of children who are at greater risk for diseases, right? So I think in the future, unless we figure out we have appropriate measures and they're used well and they are empowering for families, it's information that families will find helpful and that will not be misused. There's a limit how far we can go in dealing with these kind of this biological embedding of adversity without having a way to measure. It's kind of, we, we're flying without radar. And and I don't want to be part of anything. You know, that's the other thing. I feel like so much solidarity with the pediatricians. It's what, it's what first do no harm, right? It'd be better to have no measurement than have measurement that does really bad stuff. But without measurement, there's just very great limitations. You know, there we go. So we've got, we've got to figure this out. And we're early. We're not close to being able to do things at scale, but we're very close to start to pilot these in carefully controlled settings, where it's very much controlled by parents as well as clinicians. One parent who told us in the piloting, with all of it, is that they really wanted to learn more about this because they hear so much about the impact of stress on kids and they're in stressful environments. They want to know how their kids are doing. There's a good example of information that's empowering as long as it's used to kind of promote health and not used to label kids or categorize them or put them in, in, in more vulnerability. So it's very complicated, but it's gotta be part of the future. So thank you for the question. I don't know whether I'm being too open about this in an open forum with all these people here and I don't know anybody because this is, these are, this is our responsibility as pediatricians. We, I mean, we can't, we can't say the science is just for treating leukemia and cystic fibrosis. And it's not for figuring out how to prevent diseases that disproportionately affect kids and families who are facing significant adversity. We've got to figure this out. And it starts by determining that we're gonna do it and making sure that we do it in partnership with everyone who's affected by this. It's not just for work in the laboratory. That's a, a great segue into my question for you. Um, can you hear me? I am, I'm really, it's really a struggle, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the right balance between cutting you off and cutting out the echo. So we're, but I'm okay. Can you, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Yep. Okay. You sound, yep. Perfect. Um, so, uh, you know, my office is funding a piece of the early childhood infrastructure, which is the home visiting and parenting supports delivered at the community level. And you mentioned- oh, Hold on one second. I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. Please slow down because the- It's a slap. Echoes of a sentence before a pen. Drowning now would use it. And if you could talk a little louder and slower, that would be great. I'm okay. sorry. No problem. Um, I was going to ask you to really talk about your idea of 
taking the, a precision medicine approach and applying it to the intersection between pediatrics and all these other supports that offer kind of resilience or stress reduction for parents. You, I've heard you talk about it. And, and if you could, I think folks would really benefit from hearing that um, kind of analogy. And if you could give an example of, of that in, in a pediatric practice, someone who's maybe figured out how to operationalize a, a broader diagnostics in this upstream yep. space, that'd be awesome. I, it's, a, it's a great question. It, it, it's, I'm, I love this question. And it's, um, I'll give you the punchline is that I have much more thoughts about how we figure this out than an answer to your question, but, but it's a very important question. So, so let me put it this way. Um, the precision medicine example, what I think is most powerful about it is related to the second concept in my first slide. It's like everything's about variability. Everything's about individual variation in response to whatever. Okay? So, um, and what precision medicine is doing, the best example is in pediatrics. It's in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, the most common form of cancer in children. Um, the, the, the improval and survival, the improve, improvement in survival rates over the last 20 or 30 years has been dramatic with no new treatments discovered in the last 20 to 30 years. Not a single one new treatment. Um, as, the, as the survival rates, five-year rates went from 60% to way over 90%. How did that happen with no new treatments? Because people figured out how at the time of diagnosis, they figure out which of the subtypes you have and which of the array of treatment protocols work best for your particular subtype. And the impacts went way up through the roof. So that's a, the principle there is tremendously important. If you don't figure out differential response to what you're doing, you're, not, you, you're just going to kind of get these kind of medium effects in this bubble. But here, now we're going to get into, and so the same principle should be, and I've already probably yammered about it too much today already, is that we can't just assume that, so, so you live in poverty, so this is the intervention, right? Or, or your family is subjected to the threats and hardships of racism, here's the racism intervention, right? It doesn't work that way. So we have to start thinking in a much more kind of segmented way of how do we understand not, it can't be on a policy perspective, individual by individual, but how do we understand how to think about where the subgroup differences are in response? Um, but the problem, the danger here is that it's not the same, poverty is not the same as leukemia, right? Um, so um, the, what's driven precision medicine is biomarkers, biomarkers of disease that basically get to the causal mechanisms of those diseases, and the biomarker is matched to a disease. We are in no way saying that a measure of stress activation is a predictor of a specific disease. It is not a biomarker as the NIH kind of and the FDA define biomarkers, which are connected to precise disease markers. They are indicators of increased stress activation, which puts them in the category of a risk factor. And if that's misused and people start saying we're diagnosing diseases early in life, we've, we've done really bad stuff. At home. So the precision medicine approach is about tertiary care treatment of disease. And we're talking about being more, having a more segmented approach and understanding variability and how we promote health and prevent disease in, in a very heterogeneous context, right? So that's that's the similarity, and that's the difference. And and the way and we'll figure that out as we start trying to figure it out. We won't figure it out if we don't go down there. Um, even things like without the biology. Um, so let's just say people are are identifying kids with and families with low income and with low parent education. Well, why would anybody think that those factors enough or an A score of whatever and a certain cutoff? Why would we think that that's telling us what kind of an intervention may be appropriate? Um, but poverty has a lot of components to it. But what about poverty plus substance abuse, addiction? What about poverty plus depression? What about poverty plus or minus each of those? What about poverty plus intimate partner violence in a family? Um, do none of those things matter? They don't require different approaches, not even to mention the fact 
that children will respond differently. So that's where I think precision medicine thinking needs to come in. We need to be more precise about what's the problem we're dealing with, what's the challenge or unmet need, and what do we know about which strategies work best for which kinds of kids and families. That's that's where we have to go. And at that point now, I have no answers specifically except to say we have to start thinking that way. And medical education and residency training has to start helping pediatricians think that way from the very beginning. Because I'm sure I'm, I'm not in medical education anymore. I'm sure in the preclinical years, future pediatricians are learning a lot about the molecular biology of the genome. You need to connect that to how do you translate that into the way you think about gene environment interaction in practice. It's an application issue. And would you have any advice for the, you know, the other direction for organizations looking to offer supports or that, that are ref- kind of resources, how they connect with pediatrics to be helpful? We, we hear a lot that pediatrics are overwhelmed, that they don't have time, that they have a lot of people coming um, to interact and intersect. And I, I mean, I know that this is way outside of um, probably what you're looking at every day, but but any, I think any words for those folks looking to connect meaningfully with the pediatric practices in their community would be helpful. So kind of early in my career, I, I worked in a community health center for, for uh, a few years. And I also, um, I ran a community-based uh, system of early childhood programs out of a pediatrics department. So I know those worlds. I know those worlds. And I, um, and I have to say deep, deep, deep in my heart, I am in complete solidarity with the pressures and the outrageous context in which a lot of this stuff um, is happening. And people are trying really hard to do things in a different way. And they're dealing with the constraints of time and inadequate reimbursement and all of those things. I, I, and I don't mean to just pay lip service. I, I, am, I am like in complete solidarity with that. And, and like everything else, in, in the sense that, it, that we should not be putting the burden just on parents who are living in really difficult circumstances to blame them for their children having problems. We shouldn't be blaming pediatricians and early childhood providers about the fact that what's going on is making a big enough difference. Recognize that people are making a big difference every day in the lives of a lot of folks. In fact, one of a, a seminal moment for me and when we were speaking with a group of early childhood programs trying to put together an innovation cluster. And t- so we people would identify for us the best programs in the state that they felt were working in early childhood. And um, they, they broke into two groups. People who said to us, we'd love to be part of this because we are you know, at the cutting edge and we'd really like to help move it. And people who said, we'd love to be part of this because we know we're considered at the cutting edge. And every day we see what a big difference we're making in the lives of so many families and children, but also every day at the end of the day, we can identify families that we feel we've had no impact on at all, and we're desperate for new ideas and we're desperate for things to do. And that's that's where the heart of the leading edge is going to be. The people who are doing really good stuff in very tough circumstances who are also really unhappy with how much of an impact they're making for some of the children and families and who kind of need, they need, they need some a protected environment to kind of try new things. You know, innovation happens in an environment where you are allowed to fail. We don't allow failure in our systems, you know. Failure means, oh my goodness, they're going to take my funding away. So, so the way things are going to happen is we've got all of this really underused science. We've got unbelievably motivated people in pediatrics and in early childhood programs. We're desperate to try new things. And we need an environment, we need a policy environment that at least creates some spaces. It's like basic R&D, business people understand that. You know, the people who are given some space to try new things. And, and you know, my, my early training, my fellowship training was in developmental pediatrics. So I was always in an interdisciplinary setting. So I kind of, I, I, my roots are there. And I remember in the beginning being with trainees in other areas it was easy for all of us to say we didn't know anything because we were just learning, right? And, and it took time. We knew things were working when we could all sit together around a particular child and family where we weren't quite sure what to do. And we could look at each other and say, I don't know what to do. What do you think? What do you think, right? This, this need to somehow come up with an answer all the time. We have a lot of answers a lot of the time, but 
we need space to kind of figure things out from where things are not working as well. And we need, I think the hierarchy issues are also still a problem, right? I mean, the pediatrics is not male dominated like it used to be, but there's a, there's a, there's a hierarchy that we have to deal with in terms of how much people are paid, what their status is. That's, all those things can be worked out. But um, I think the main thing is this is a community-based issue, right? I mean, training is not a community-based issue, but figuring out how people in pediatrics and in early childhood programs could work together, the answer is at a community level, building systems based on relationships and that relationships that take time to build. No pediatrician has a child with a suspected heart problem who says, I'm just gonna send this kid to a hospital to some people who do cardiology and let them take care of it. You find out who you wanna work with, you find out who you trust, you find out how to learn from them and you build those relationships. That happens a lot between pediatrics and many early childhood programs, but it doesn't happen universally. And because everybody's overworked, everybody's underpaid, has to be a lot of motivation to do it. We need to make it easier to build those systems. This is a systems building issue at the community level. Pediatrics has to be in the middle of that. It can't be the thing where people say, let's make sure we connect the system to pediatrics. It can't be on the outside. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I'm a little bit self-conscious of what I said. I'm expressing my opinions and feelings. I'm, I don't mean to mean this as a pronouncement, like I have the answers. I just, I think this is stuff we figure out together. And a lot of people are way down the road. I bet you've got a lot of people in the audience now yeah. who are exemplars of that. And we need the people who are having a harder time doing that. We need to have some way for them to learn from what people who are making progress are doing. How do you learn that? It's not in the journals. It's not in professional meetings. How do we create that learning community? We do it locally. And I bet you guys are, you know, you're right in the middle of that. And all of you people whose faces I can't see out there, I mean, many of you probably are smarter about this in a way of the game. In fact, if any of you have stuff that you think would be good for me and my colleagues to learn from, could you please send that stuff in to our website? We have a place and we pay attention. We've got people who respond to email that comes into the website. If you have some things that are working and you've learned, please, we are desperate to learn about them. We'd love, we'd love to find out more. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to bring in a couple of questions that are coming out of the chat um, in particular, um, because we've had a couple of questions specifically asking about how do we address medical training to bring this information into medical training. This has been a question that's been asked to me quite a few times. And so I would like to hear what you have to say about it as well. Yeah, so um, so take this with a big grain of salt because I'm not, I'm, I, I have appointments and work with people in uh, teaching hospitals, so engage with people at Mass General Hospital and Children's Hospital in Boston. So, but I'm not involved in medical education and I'm not involved directly in residency training. You can only do so much. But here's my thought about that. This is based on an end of one experience. This is my own personal thinking. When I completed medical school and residency, I was obsessed with wanting to be engaged in solving these kinds of problems. Um, and I kind of left academic medicine and, and clinical practice to get involved in other parts of the early childhood system um, because I thought it was too hard. <laughs> to change, I, I just thought it was too hard to change training. Um, I'm back now. I used to describe myself as a recovering pediatrician. I now call myself a born again pediatrician. I'm kind of, I'm coming back and I'll tell you why I'm coming back. I mean, but other people are gonna have to do this. This is, this is for the next generation. For those of you who are really in their careers um, who are interested in this, here's, here's my thoughts, N of one thoughts. Um, making the case for why this stuff is so important for health promotion and disease prevention, and why early childhood context is so important for development. Um, has been, I, I mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago. In, in academic medicine, this is seen as not really medicine. It's seen as a referral to social services or human services. Um, and I don't mean, I, don't, I have to be careful. I don't mean that people don't think it's important. But I mean, they don't see it 
as part of what medicine is all about. And I think that the, stat the clock is ticking and the statute of limitations is coming up very quickly on that thinking because the heart of how we can understand what to do better about health promotion, disease prevention is, is to be found in insights from molecular biology and neuroscience. And this is getting to the heart of where the most exciting frontiers are in, in science-driven academic medicine. So it's one thing to say kids aren't doing well in school, we have disparities in health camps, even to talk about unequal access to health care and unequal treatment in the healthcare system, that all of which are very real. But those are seen as not necessarily what a medical, what medical training necessarily will do. I don't agree with that. But, but now it's like the answers, the answers to the breakthroughs, just like the breakthroughs in, in tertiary care medicine, just like the breakthroughs in cancer, they're coming from a deeper understanding of the basic biology of cancer cells. And, and, then deeper into the biology of the pathophysiology of, of, of malignant disease. We, we're, we're getting to the point where we could start to dig into the deeper basic science about how adversity gets into the body and affects biological systems. That is part of what medical education has to be about. That is part of what the basic science, you know, by Julie Richmond, who was the founder of Head Start and Surgeon General in the Carter administration, uh, the chair that I have is in his honor. And I, I knew him. He's one of the most inspiring people I've ever known. He, he wrote a paper in 1966 where he said the child development is the basic science, should be the basic science of pediatrics. And he was right. And he's still right. Uh, but uh, actually neuroscience and molecular biology also needs part of the basic science of pediatrics. That's what's going to change the training. It's, it's a ways off, but for those of you who are into training, want to have an impact on it, it's, it's sitting there waiting to be used. The high priests of academic medicine will not be able to walk away from this. Here, here. Um, the, other, the other major question that we have been receiving that's received a lot of great votes is um, the connection between what we know about the connection between neonatal intensive Wait, care. Hang on one second. I've got to change this volume. Hang on. Change that again. Go ahead. The Sorry. connection between neonatal intensive care unit stays and later development in particular. This is, um, I, I do have to say, it's great that we got this question. And I, as somebody who supports our, our Texas um, Perinatal Quality Improvement Collaborative, this is a common question that we have among our NICUs. This is a, this is a hot question we have in our NICUs, is what they can do to make to to increase and maximize behavior and build resiliency in the NICU, and what the NICU environment is doing to kids, and yeah, um, if you can that, speak to the data about that. You guys ask the best questions. That is a spectacular question. So, so again, there's a there's a recurring theme here about the lag between um, kind of scientific knowledge and scientific insights and application in kind of real world practice. You know, to step back for a minute, I, I don't know whether this is still true, but for a long time, there was this thing in, that was clearing in academic medicine that the lag time between the actual discovery and demonstration of a significant improvement in treatment, the things, the lag time between that and when it got to the point of widespread application through practice, it was like 17 years or something. So, so in everything, there's always this lag, early adopters and the rest of the field and everything else. The NICU is particularly important for a couple of reasons, and I really want to thank whoever asked that question. First off, um, there's the issue of, of persistence, patient, inpatient persistence, or, uh, persistent inpatience, whatever you want to call it. It just takes a long time for this stuff to get through. There was research done decades ago by Barry Brazelton and people like Heidi Alice who worked with him. Heidi Alice had a number of beautiful randomized controlled trials showing that babies in the NICU, very premature, low birth weight babies who were in isolates and, you know, in bright lights and loud noises and very little human contact, uh, when they provided some well-measured times of parent contact, physical contact, lower the lights, 
try to lower the noise. Um, and aside from predictions that that's going to help development, they decreased the numbers of days they were on a ventilator, they decreased their oxygen dependence, they were discharged earlier, I mean, all that stuff. That's decades old research, right? And a number of NICUs kind of paid attention to that and changed their practices, and many didn't. Um, I think the, the science that, that I kind of teed up in this session um, is all over the prenatal and perinatal period, right? I mean, it's, in fact, if I could be permitted to put one of my, could everybody, if I could ask one, one other thing of everybody in the audience, could everybody stop using the term zero when you mean birth? We talk about zero to three or zero to two. That is not, if, if, if by zero you mean nothing happens before that, no, that's wrong. So much happens before that. And in fact, even if we took it to be the moment of conception, we know that so much of development is affected by the health of the mother and, and probably the father as well before the pregnancy begins. So we are, this is funny because now it gets into how pediatrics engages with, with obstetrics and engages with community health and family medicine. Um, that's, that's the other thing that science is screaming. It's like, this is a lifespan understanding here. If you come in at any point, even for internal medicine, there will be a time, I think, when internal medicine will recognize that health promotion disease prevention for adults can't start with, with dieting and exercise for people in their 30s and 40s, right? All these conditions have early roots. So yes, we already have a fair amount of knowledge about how much the, 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 the NICU environment affects the development of the brain. Um, there's more to come in terms of how it's affecting other systems. Um, the microbiome, for those of you who are on top of that part of the science, there's all of this research now on the microbiome, which is the bacteria and the viruses that live in the gut, okay, and then the, in the oral cavity. Um, uh, until the moment of birth, uh, it's, it's sterile, right? And as soon as you're born, um, organisms start to populate your intestines and they affect the development of your immune system and they actually interact with your brain development, right? And they're influenced by um, how you're fed, and, and contact and, you know, are there pets in the environment? In fact, this obsession with cleanliness um, may have some real serious consequences for some babies. So um, the NICU perinatal period in the moment you're in an extra uterine environment. It's like if we think that this is all about the interaction between environment and genetics. So prenatally, it's the, it's the intrauterine environment. Postnatally, as soon as the cord is cut, the extra uterine environment for some kids is a nursery, an intensive care nursery with all this development that's on a certain timetable that was supposed to happen for four or six more weeks in utero. And now it's happening in an intensive care unit. It takes no imagination to say, this is a very different environment. It's having a very different impact on gene expression and development. We have a lot that more that we need to learn about that. It's a very important question. Um, and once again, pediatric training is mostly focused on the kind of, you know, the, the, the medical management of um, lung function and infection and whatever else. Nutrition. Thank you so much. And I just want to give you a round of applause because I know you can't hear everybody who mm -hmm. is online, but the amount of, of amazing comments that we're receiving is, is pretty spectacular. And I just want to say thank you so much for speaking um, at the summit. And I really, really appreciate it. Um, so we're so going back, back at you. I really, obviously, really okay. appreciate the opportunity. Also, appreciate the opportunity to have this much time to talk mm -hmm. about this, as opposed yeah. to you know, give a fifteen-minute presentation to a screen with nobody there and walk away. I, um, I just really appreciate the interest on your part and the audience. And I'm going to be watching Texas real closely. I'm getting increasingly <laughs> interested in what's happening in Texas. So uh, let's stay in touch. I really. I really mean that. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this conference. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be ending the session, and then we're going to move everybody into the next one. So Dr. Osborne is getting ready for our next session, and we will see you. Um, we'll see all the attendees in the next session. And thank you again so much, Jack. Thank Bye -bye. you, Jack. Thank you.